today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. For most of the United States Army divisions which fought in Korea, that land was a strange and alien one. But not for the 7th Infantry Division. When the 7th, along with the Marines and other elements of the 10th Corps, executed the bold invasion of Incheon in the early fall of 1950, it was for the division a return to a land it had known in calmer times. For at the end of World War II, the 7th Division had moved into Korea to accept the surrender of the Japanese troops south of the 38th parallel. The division remained in South Korea on occupation duty until the end of 1948 when it left for Japan. Less than two years later, the 7th Division was back in Korea, fighting this time to drive a new aggressor from the tortured land of the morning calm. This is the story of the 7th Infantry Division's performance in that fight. By the end of World War II, the 7th Infantry Division had learned a good deal about amphibious invasion. It had made some of the toughest, Kwajalein and Leyte and Okinawa. In 1946, with victory, there remained one other landing in the Pacific for the division to make, Korea. Korea was not yet a name to weigh heavily on the world's conscience. It was just a remote Asiatic peninsula whose people had suffered for years under Japanese occupation and welcomed now the victorious allies who had come to accept the enemy's surrender. For the men of the 7th Division, this was how the vision of victory, so tenaciously held in days of trouble, became real. A bitter and oppressive enemy was defeated. And with that defeat, a new day of peace and stability promised to return to the troubled Orient and to the entire world. In victory, there was hope, and even over the unhappily destined land of Korea, no shadow fell to mar that hope in the days that followed the end of the Second World War. Korea was an old country, but a quaint one, and what it lacked in modernization, it made up in friendliness. Its towns and villages were unscarred then. Its people were happy. Life for the soldiers of the 7th Division was not one of high excitement but theirs was an important mission, for they were there to help the country establish itself as a free and independent nation. Their area of responsibility lay south of the 38th parallel, which separated Western and Russian responsibility. And in those first hopeful months of victory, the men of the 7th Division were shown the deceptive face of Russian cooperation. The 38th parallel, however, in the disillusioning months that followed, became an armed border, which the 7th Division guarded to preserve the peace until the division left Korea in 1948. The communist violation of that peace brought the 7th Division back to Korea in September of 1950 as part of the 10th Corps' spectacular invasion of Incheon. Warfare in Korea was three months old when the 7th Division, along with the Marines, invaded the port on Korea's western coast below the capital city of Seoul. Other elements of the United Nations forces hastily put into battle to stem the North Koreans' aggressive adventure 
were holding desperately to the port of Busan in the south. The Inchon invasion, in the very heart of the land the enemy held, gave heart and hope to those beleaguered divisions, and indeed to the entire worried world of free men. The Korean people welcomed the 7th Division back to their land as more than old friends. American soldiers now stood between them and a new subjugation. For the men of the 7th, there was a difference too. The calm and peaceful Korea they had known had disappeared, and the roads of this new land were hard to travel. Swiftly forming resistance, the division pushed steadily inland. The North Korean enemy was strong, and he had had a series of successes. But the Incheon invasion had caught him by surprise. Taking fullest advantage of this surprise, the 7th Division was able to establish strong positions before the enemy could rally. After the invasion, the 1st Cavalry Division broke out of the Pusan perimeter in the south and drove north 102 miles to link up with the 7th. At Osan, the 7th Division waited. The link up was a triumphant turning point in the war, splitting the enemy's forces in half. Once the juncture was made, the 7th Division pushed straight north toward Seoul. Little more than a week after the Incheon landing, they had reached the banks of the Han River, which separated them from Seoul. First elements of the division crossed the river on the 25th of September. As they touched shore on the opposite bank, the greatest prize of the war was just ahead, Seoul and they pushed toward it, removing all opposition in their path. Seoul lay in ruins when the United Nations forces reached it. Korea's once magnificent capital city had been shelled and burned by the enemy in his drive south, and the United Nations had been forced to fire upon it to drive the enemy out. Consequently, many of its buildings were rubble, many of its structures reduced to powdered ash, but for all its devastation, Seoul was South Korea's first city and the symbol of the young nation's integrity. So it was a triumphant day when General MacArthur, commander of the UN forces, was able to deliver the city once again to the nation's president, Syngman Rhee. With Seoul secure, the 7th Division regrouped and undertook another amphibious invasion in enemy-held land. This time, at Iwan, on the east coast of the peninsula. It was late October 1950 when the 7th Division landed at Iwan. The landing was unopposed. The Incheon invasion in the west and the breakout of the Pusan perimeter in the south had generated a momentum which had carried the United Nations forces up to the 38th parallel and beyond it. As the men of the 7th Division came ashore at Iwan, the hope for early victory was strong. Their mission was to drive straight north and advance to the Korean-Manchurian border. Fall weather changed to winter the farther north they marched. With a bitter cold came snow, which became a formidable enemy now. But snow or cold could not stop a team that had felt the advantage shift to them in the turning tide of war and knew now that they could reach the very limits of the enemy's own land, and then the North Korean communists would be defeated. <laughs> <laughs> 
So on and on they rolled, over roads where roads existed, sometimes over terrain that was hazardous to travel. There are always more men than tanks, and someone has to walk. The towns and villages between Iwan and the border fell to them, but not without a struggle. The 7th Division saw some heavy fighting in their push north through these mountains. Dug into the hills, the communists had to be blasted out. infantrymen had to overrun the enemy in their foxholes before the land could be considered secure. Mountains were formidable barriers, but they made it to the border. By late November, part of the division had reached the banks of the Yalu River. Thanksgiving service that year, in the northernmost reaches of enemy territory, was a meaningful one. The turkey dinner was festive. Even for the men at the outposts, braving the winds off the frozen Yalu, this Thanksgiving was something special, for final victory could come now any day. Their guns were silent. They had reached the very limit of the defeated enemy's land, and there were no more enemy in sight while they enjoyed the traditional trimmings of this holiday. The turkey leg had real flavor that year. But then suddenly, all along the line, a new enemy struck, and an entirely new war began. Out of Manchuria came hordes of Chinese communist forces. The impact on the UN line was staggering. Elements of the 7th Division fighting with the 1st Marine Division at the Chosen Reservoir were outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Chinese invaders. Withdrawal was blocked by the enemy who had surrounded them. The days that followed for the embattled soldiers of the 7th Division and the Marines with whom they fought their way out of the Chinese encirclement were days of hardship and courage unbelievable hardship and unbelievable courage. In a blinding snowstorm in early December, they made their last big push to reach Hung Nam on the coast. Other elements of the 7th Division Withdrawing from the Yalu River, had easier going in their effort to reach Hong Nam. The resistance they encountered in their withdrawal was slight. All elements of the division, those who survived, reached Hong Nam successfully by December the 11th, two long and bitter weeks after the Chinese Communist offensive began. Vessels lay waiting at the port to receive the weary men who had made the long trip by land. Everything that could fight went aboard these ships. And those for whom the fighting was over. Supplies of all kinds were loaded on to be used again. Uprooted Korean people, fleeing the threat of communist enslavement, jammed the waterfront. <laughs> 
They were escaping the war, traveling along with soldiers who would fight again as soon as they could regroup in the South. The Chinese Communist Offensive had pushed the United Nations forces back to below the 38th parallel, and the advance to recover lost ground was slow and painful work. During the first few months of 1951, the soldiers of the 7th Division fought several successful engagements with the enemy, each time winning a little more real estate, pushing the United Nations line steadily north. The enemy had seeded the roads with explosives. The rough Korean weather had done its damage too and slowed the advance considerably. But the drive north rolled on despite handicaps. And in early April, the division crossed the 38th parallel. It was the first time across on land for them. And this time it was for keeps. With summer, when the war was a year old, the embattled soldiers of the 7th Division went into reserve, which for a few weeks meant a clean bunk and some fresh clothes. It gave weary men a chance to read mail from home and to catch up with the history being made all around. It was still field rations for Chow, but the enemy's guns were a long way away, and that can be a great help to digestion. In reserve, the men of the division created their own entertainment. and gratefully took the entertainment that was supplied them by visiting performers. No troubadour ever received a warmer or more enthusiastic welcome from his audience than did the entertainment troops who visited the United Nations fighters in Korea. No supper club performer, however much his patrons paid to watch him, ever had it so good. While they were on reserve that June of 1951, the world was charged with hope that the fighting might end. The Soviet Union made overtures today to end the fighting in Korea by suggesting that the two sides get together for talks to set a ceasefire. Such a proposal coming from Russia left little doubt that the communist forces fighting in Korea are at last willing to discuss peace. The hope sparked by that announcement did not bring an early end to the fighting. For the first year after the peace talks began, however, the war was a relatively limited one for the 7th Division. But even when the enemy was quiet, the division's soldiers continued their battle with the Korean weather. Heavy rains made the already poor roads impassable, and the troops used every lull in the fighting to put them in shape again. For the most part, that first year of peace talks was for the 7th Division a time of constant patrol activity. A patrol is not a large group of men, usually about a squad. Its missions and its accomplishments are seldom on a spectacular scale. It's rare that the activities of a patrol gain the attention of the public or anyone outside the command itself. But as much as anything else in battle, the patrol is the slogging, day-to-day -day business of war. It was so in Korea. On days when the headlines reported light or scattered action, these hills were alive with men out on patrol. A patrol can have any one of a number of missions, 
to gather information about the enemy's strength or location, or the nature of his terrain, to protect the main body of a unit, or to actually engage the enemy in combat. Often a patrol finds itself so engaged before its mission is over. It's grim work, but it's soldiers' work. It's work that the men of the 7th Infantry Division did a lot in that quiet first year of armistice talks, while the world waited with fading hope for peace. Then the 7th Division went on an all-out offensive to take a mass of critical hills in the Kumwa Valley. The enemy's strong positions were blasted first from the air. Wave after wave of pulverizing airstrikes were necessary to soften up the objective area. away incessantly while the tanks got in position to add their fire. The infantry waited to take over with rifles and bayonets which the job would finally demand. The hills these men fought for became known to the world as Triangle Hill Complex. The soldiers knew only that the hills were steep, that they were alive with enemy fire and that they had to be taken. everything they had into the assault. And finally, the mass of vital high ground was there. Their corps commander said of these men during this period that they showed a determination that recognized no defeat, a voluntary spirit of self-sacrifice, and a quality of leadership thoroughly in keeping with the finest traditions of the service. In July 1953, the men of the 7th Division learned the news the world had been waiting to hear. The fighting was over. After three years of war and two years of peace talks, a ceasefire was signed between the UN forces and the communists. To the free world as a whole, the news meant that the United Nations had proved that aggression can be stopped through concerted effort. To the soldier on the line, it meant this, but something a good deal more fundamental besides. It meant there would be a silence now on the battlefield, and days without fear. After the truce was signed, the 7th Division tore down their bunkers and moved back to the ceasefire positions. Battlefield equipment, now no longer needed, was packed and stored away. The tools of war, ammunition and explosives which would not be needed for battle 
went to the rear now, instead of being rushed to the front. The 7th Division is still in Korea today. With the fighting over, they have time now for relaxation and recreation. Invariably, their entertainment, like this carnival staged at Busan, has about it a strong flavor of horseplay, USA. The evidence of American interest, which the 7th Division symbolizes in Korea today, is everywhere apparent. The blood of America's sons and the treasure of its people are invested in the freedom of this beleaguered nation. And these gallant soldiers remain here to represent that investment. They are ambassadors now as well as soldiers, with a job that goes on month after month without ceasing. It is inevitable that some of the spirit and tradition of their homeland lives and grows here with them. Peace, however fragile, rests over Korea today. And as once before in their proud and venerable history, the soldiers of the 7th Infantry Division are standing alert to preserve that peace. And that is the story of the 7th Division in Korea. Now, this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army. This is war. War and its masses. War and its men. War and its machines. Together they form the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. The big picture is a report to you from your army, an army committed by you, the people of the United States, to stop communist aggression wherever it may strike. The big picture traces the course of events in the Korean campaign through first-hand reports of our combat veterans and through film taken by combat cameramen of the armed forces produced by the Army Signal Corps. These are the men who daily record on film the big picture as it happens, where it happens. Today our big picture will show the United Nations forces on the offensive. You'll see the recapture of the city of Seoul, the fall of the North Korean capital of Pyongyang, You'll see an airdrop by the 187th Regimental Combat Team. You'll see the Missouri in action, the Big Mo, as it gives support to our ground troops. And later, you'll meet a man of the Army Infantry, Corporal David Gray. Now, let's go back to September 1950. On 20 September, almost three months after the North Korean Communists launched their invasion, United Nations troops are in the first stages of their all-out drive toward North Korea. Five days previously, they went from the defensive to the offensive, when U.S. Marines made an amphibious landing 150 miles behind the enemy lines at Incheon. The landing cut off the enemy from his supplies and caught him in a giant United Nations pincers. Air Force, Navy, and Marine planes give support to ground troops and cut off communist attempts to bring up reinforcements from the north and south. Thank <laughs> you.
Exactly three months to the day after the city of Seoul fell to the communist invaders, UN forces recapture this South Korean capital. These are Marines and U.S. 7th Division troops advancing into Seoul under enemy fire. Street fighting rages throughout the city. The Reds have fortified many of the buildings, and Red tanks may appear around any corner. It had been hoped that Seoul might be recaptured with a minimum of destruction. But this is impossible, as the Reds stage a house-to-house -house fight. After a five-day battle for Seoul, General MacArthur announces the city's recapture on 26 September. There is still fighting in the city, but the main communist garrison is now fleeing to the north. UN troops rest as they close another chapter of history. At the Ashia Air Base in Japan during the battle for Seoul, the 187th Airborne Regiment arrives from the United States. Ammunition and other supplies are loaded on unit vehicles which will be flown to Korea. The paratroopers, 2400 strong, board C-54 transports and C-119 flying boxcars for their flight to the combat zone. is the destination. The paratroopers are rushed to staging areas as fast as they unload. The same C-54s fly wounded back to Japan. In its first four days of operation, the Kimpo airlift evacuated 313 wounded to Japan. Cargo and passenger planes are coming into Kempo at a rate of one every 10 minutes. Typical cargo is this disassembled 280-ton bridge. These ponton boats are part of the bridge, which was shipped entirely by air. The airfield is inspected by Air Force leaders past and present. In the group are General George C. Kenney, Commanding General, Air University, Lieutenant General George C. Stratemeyer, Commanding General, U.S. Far East Air Forces, and General Carl Spotts, retired, former commander of the U.S. Air Force. In the background is a captured Yak fighter plane found in good condition. Now land-based at Kimpo are Marine carrier planes aiding in the tactical support of ground forces north of Seoul. This F-7F Tiger Cat night fighter proves especially valuable during this stage of the fighting north of Seoul. F-7Fs are equipped with radar and are very effective against convoys and troop concentrations at night and in bad weather. These Tiger Cats and Corsairs are being loaded with 5-inch rockets for a strike near Seoul. 
October 1950, the USS Missouri steams off the coast of Korea. For the first time on an American battleship, the United Nations flag is hoisted. Admiral Alan Smith and Captain Irving Duke honor it and the cause of freedom for which it stands. Slowly, the Big Mo's massive 16 inchers swing into position, ready to lay down a barrage on enemy coastal concentrations and strong points. Inside the Big Mo, as each hour approaches, the projectiles, weighing more than a ton each, are brought up from the magazine on special elevators. And one by one are loaded into the breach. Trained and skilled as a team, the gun crew work with clockwork precision as they ready the guns and load bags of powder into the breach. An officer takes a last minute reading on the target and everything is set. Gun covers off. The last seconds tick away. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Salvo after salvo pour into the enemy positions as the Missouri opens up with everything it's got, pounding the enemy shore batteries and installations. Reds fight back, their shells narrowly missing the ship. Big and small guns carry on the barrage, hitting supply lines, wiping out ammunition dumps, hammering a halt to the Red Army's aggression. typhoon hits the U.S. Sakai Army base in Japan. With rain and wind ranging up to 110 miles per hour, it is the worst storm to hit Japan in 16 years. Corrugated metal roofing flies through the air like paper. Most of the tiles, shingle, and corrugated metal roofs are damaged. The concrete structures withstand the storm well, although windows are broken and there is water damage. There are no military casualties from the storm since most of the troops remain indoors in the stronger buildings, safe from the falling trees and power lines. But among the Japanese in the storm's path, 135 are killed, over a thousand injured, and over 200,000 made homeless. The heaviest military damage is suffered by wooden and tar paper buildings. These tropical storms are expected near the Sea of Japan at this time of the year. October 17 is a suspenseful day for the U.S. 1st Cavalrymen as they advance into the outskirts of Pyongyang, capital city of North Korea. The city is known to be heavily fortified, and it is expected that the Reds will make a death stand for their capital. It is reported that the Reds have 30,000 men defending Pyongyang. Another red is added to the 75,000 captured so far. A vehicle burns beside the road. Ammunition explodes in the fire. The attack is led by tanks as the first cavalry advances under fire toward the center of the city. The railroad guides them. 
Unsurprisingly, the enemy fire weakened as U.S. infantrymen reached the heart of the city. The Reds are withdrawing. Although there is occasional rear guard fire and sniper activity, the main Red force has begun to flee northward in disorganization. A company medic gives first aid to a cavalryman wounded in the street fighting. As the first cavalrymen overrun the city, South Korean troops join them. The ROK forces met heavy resistance on the east side of town, but finally fought their way through after six hours. They are following the retreating enemy northward. An estimated red force of 30,000 is now fleeing Pyongyang. South Koreans and 1st Cavalrymen join forces, decide their zones of action, and move on. In the eastern area of Pyongyang, near the Taedong River, the South Koreans encounter a pocket of enemy rear guard troops and pause to wipe them out. Only small arms fire is necessary as the river is crossed by bridge and assault boats. As UN forces take over the city, the North Korean communist government has vanished, presumably having fled north across the Manchurian border. The heavily fortified capital of Korean communism is now under the United Nations flag. This was a hard blow for the North Koreans, the fall of their capital city, Pyongyang. While this action was going on, Corporal David Gray, machine gunner, was serving with Task Force Walker. Well, Dave, tell us, what was your mission with this task force? Well, our mission on Task Force Walker was that we was being used as uh, more or less a guerrilla force, just like uh, the rest of the outfits were having trouble with guerrillas. We was designated as an uh, American guerrilla force to knock them out. Mm -hmm. Were you trained for this type we of fighting? Was, we was trained here in the States before we went overseas. That was our main training uh -huh. in the States. Did you take a lot of prisoners here, Dave? We taken quite a few prisoners on that uh, mission up through there, all the way up to Pyongyang. Did they give up easily? At first they didn't, but towards the end they seemed to be willing to give up. Did you uh, speak to any of the prisoners, Dave? I spoke to quite a few of them. I spoke to one officer uh, that gave up there. They all had these safe conduct passes. They got them when these planes went over and dropped them. They all came down with them. Well, Dave, you might describe the landing of the uh, 187. It was one of the first combat jumps I've ever, I'd ever seen. And I mean, it was something to watch how they dropped the jeeps, they dropped uh, 105 howitzers in there. They dropped, and it was all just, it was done in a hurry. I mean, everything hit the ground, it was all over with. It was that quick. Now, this is a complete regiment by Com itself. Complete regiment. I mean, they could operate by themselves. They had everything that they needed by themselves. Drop out of the air and then move forward. That's right. right. Well, after this action, Dave, you, you moved on to the north, and it wasn't long before you met the Chinese communists. Isn't that right? Well, the first contact we had with the Chinese was two days after Thanksgiving up in a little town called Kunari on the Taedong River. Now, what, what were you doing at the time? We was just moving forward slowly, trying to get up even on the line with all the other divisions up there. So uh, that certain date there, we hit these Chinese on this mountain. We didn't know the Chinese at the time, and we got orders to take a hill there in my company. So we started up the hill, and uh, everything was quiet. So all at once, bugles broke loose, artillery, mortars, everything happened to us. We was cut off on the hill there. And we couldn't go neither way. We couldn't go backwards. We couldn't go forward. So we were just stuck there. We had to fight it out right there. You were wounded at this time, too, Dave. I you? was wounded at the time, yeah. And then taken prisoner? I was taken prisoner on top of the hill. What sort of treatment did you get? I got as good a treatment as I could expect, I guess. I, there was no medical treatment for me. I mean, they didn't have any to give me. They had no medics with them? They had no medics with them. They weren't taking care of their own wounded either? They wasn't taking care of their own wounded. It was every man for himself. They fight a good deal different than we do, don't they, A Dan? good deal. Aren't our medics always right up there with us? Our medics are right there, but uh, there's, there's nothing doing. and nobody to take care of the wounded. No. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you uh, get away from the Chinese communists? I got away from them before I stayed prisoner four days and four nights, and they, they got careless, I guess. They started back down the river with me. Instead of going north, they went south. 
They had our American 38th Infantry and 23rd Regiment trapped down the river about 15 miles. So we went down the river, and uh, when these Chinese got between them, they broke out of this trap and hit the chain of Chinese from both sides. And during the fighting, well, I got down on the ice and I crawled down the river about a thousand yards or so, and I got up and made a break for it. I but got picked up in a jeep on the road. Felt pretty good to get back to our lines again. Felt right? good to me, yes. Well, did they treat your wounds immediately? They treated me pretty good, yeah. They sent me right back to Seoul on the train. And from there I went to Pusan, from there to Japan, and it, was all, it all worked smoothly. I came right, right straight back to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, how long from the time you were wounded uh, was it until you get back to the States? Seven days. Well, that's pretty fast, isn't it? Was pretty fast, yes. Thank you, Dave. We spoke about the 187th Regimental Combat Team. Now let's watch these films taken by a Signal Corps cameraman. You'll see that airdrop. As UN forces take the North Korean capital at Pyongyang, a new threat to the Reds gets underway at Kimpo Airfield. Paratroopers of the 187th Airborne Regiment plan to jump ahead of the Reds fleeing Pyongyang, cutting off their escape route to the border. The planes are C-47 transports and C-119 boxcars. There are over 4,000 men in this operation, which consists of two separate drops on 20 and 21 October. The destination is a point 33 miles north of Pyongyang, where the Reds are fleeing through the towns of Sukchan and Sunchan. bail out in waves from a dozen planes at a time. On the ground, there is practically no opposition. The attack comes as a complete surprise. Watching the jump is General MacArthur, who flew here from Japan to observe this first airborne operation of the Korean War. Flying over the attack area in his constellation, the United Nations commander stated, this closes the trap on the enemy. Of particular interest in this drop is the parachuting of heavy equipment, vehicles and artillery. The equipment drop takes place 10 minutes after the personnel have landed. Most of the material lands without damage, and the paratroopers rush out to put it into action. Transportation found available on the scene is pressed into service. the big jump was delayed at the start by bad weather, it moves like clockwork once it gets underway. Casualties are few. Out of the 4,064 men who made the two jumps, only 90 men are listed as jump casualties, and most of these consist of broken legs and sprains. Evacuation is rapid. Specially equipped helicopters land to carry the wounded, and they are quickly on their way back to the hospital. Shortly after the paratroopers take their positions, they are joined by tanks of the 1st Cavalry Division which have pushed through from Pyongyang. As these forces join, the last remnants of the Red Army are compressed into an area only 50 miles from the Manchurian border. On 17 September at Busan Air Base, 
a transport plane arrives with the first big-name entertainer to visit the troops in Korea. Al Jolson, often billed as the world's greatest entertainer, is in the midst of his last road tour. A veteran of years in show business and months of entertaining troops in World War II in Europe, Africa, India, and the South Pacific, Al Jolson disregarded his doctor's warning and at the age of 64, set out to entertain troops in hospitals and at the Korean battlefront. In front of the audience he liked best, Jolson gives one of his last performances. GI audience enjoys his act. Al entertained Korean War casualties in Japan before arriving in Korea and already has used up much of the seemingly boundless energy which he put into every performance. It was impossible for Al Jolson not to give out with all his energy and all his heart. His gaiety and rhythm was infectious, and he knew it could bring joy to others. On 23 October, six days after he gave this performance, Al Jolson died from a heart attack in San Francisco. One of his last acts in Korea was to raise a United Nations flag. During the month covered by this combat bulletin, the United Nations drive into North Korea moved ahead with surprising rapidity. On 20 September, UN forces were fighting in the outskirts of Seoul, fanning south from the Incheon landing and breaking out of their old beachhead. By 5 October, Republic of Korea troops had crossed the 38th parallel and were 55 air miles beyond the imaginary border between North and South Korea. On the west, U.S. troops were meeting some resistance north of Seoul. United Nations forces, including U.S., British, and Australian troops, were regrouping, an expectation of a full-scale drive across the parallel after the United Nations voted approval for General MacArthur to send his troops into North Korea. By 20 October, communist forces were staggering, throwing off their uniforms and surrendering at the rate of 2,400 daily. The day before, Pyongyang, North Korean capital, had been captured by UN troops. Two hours after Pyongyang was declared secure, members of the 187th Airborne Regiment dropped from planes 33 miles above Pyongyang and about 75 miles from the Manchurian border. South Korean troops drove westward to link up with the paratroopers. On the east coast, South Korean troops had taken Wonsan with unexpectedly light resistance and were advancing far to the north. Disintegrating communist troops were attempting to flee to the Manchurian border. There was still fighting ahead, but at this time, it appeared that the Korean War was, as General MacArthur phrased it, definitely coming to an end. Those were the events that comprised the big picture from September 20th to October 20th, 1950. Our thanks to Corporal David Gray for being with us. Next week, the big picture will show you the entrance of the Chinese Reds into the Korean War. You'll see our troops battling the winter cold as well as the communists. You'll see our wounded evacuated by helicopter and a display of the finest weapons of modern warfare, the weapons of your United States Army. You'll hear another report from a Korean veteran, an Army soldier who saw, as it happened, a part of the big picture. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then.